Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this nutritional webinar. Thank you for being here with us today to share and update information on pediatric nutrition. Before starting the scientific program, I want to first share information about the logistics of this event. We are broadcasting via Zoom and via YouTube. They both have question and answer areas. In the Zoom is in the bar below the Q&A. Our topic for tonight is iron for young children reinforcing the message. Our speaker is Dr. Michelle Payasak. Dr. Michelle Payasak is a global therapeutic area section head, gastroenterology at Paracel. He's a board certified gastroenterologist and pediatrician with over 27 years of experience in taking care of complex intestinal, nutritional, liver, and pan pancreatic diseases in both children and adults. She has almost 20 years of involvement with both global and local pharmaceutical companies and laboratories contributing to drug design, clinical studies development, data monitoring safety, FDA submission, and clinical research laboratory regulations. At Pat itself, she is bringing her medical leadership and expertise in gastrointestinal nutrition hepatic and pancreatic diseases to clinical studies. Her main area of expertise include pediatric nutrition, celiac diseases, inflammatory bowel diseases such as Crohn and ulcerative colitis, non-alcoholic fatty liver diseases, malabsorption and manipulation of the intestinal microbiome. She received her medical degree at the State University of New York at Buffalo School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences. She completed her residency in pediatric and fellowship in gastroenterology and nutrition at the Children's Hospital Los Angeles and the University of Southern California Keck School of Medicine. Dr. Paisak, serves as attending at the renowned Children's Hospital Los Angeles, consistently ranked by US News and World Report in the top four best hospital in the US and number one children's hospital in the West. At CHLA and USC, she successfully led many clinical areas, including a chief of pediatric gastroenterology and nutrition at the S USC, co-chair of the USC Keck School of Medicine, GI liver system core, direct director of CHLA nutrition support team, and chair of the CHLA nutrition advisory committee. As GI representative for the CHLA Pharmacology and Therapeutics Committee and the Pharmacy Fun uh, Functional Project Team, she was successfully in obtaining institutional approval for new drugs and devices at in initiated pediatric uh, patients database for use in clinical research projects in the Division of Gastroenterology and Nutrition and CHDLA. As a member of the North America Society of, for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition, NASGAN, Dr. Paisak has been an associated editor for the Journal of Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition for the past eight years, contributing to its rising impact factor. She has also served as NASGAN Research Committee, NASGAN Foundation, Children's Digestive Health and Nutrition Foundation, Professional Education Committee at Swantman Award Committee. 
As a member of the American Gastroenterological Association, she was awarded recognition to the Academy of Educators and is affiliated with the American Gastroenterology Asso Association on immunology, microbiology, and inflammatory bowel diseases, and basic and clinical intestinal disorders. In the corporative realm, Dr. Piatak has experience in numerous local and global preclinical and phases two for gastroenterology studies in various roles and responsibility. Let's welcome Dr. Piatak. Dr. Piatak, the floor is yours. I'm Dr. Michelle Pietzak, a pediatric gastroenterologist at the University of Southern California, Keck School of Medicine, and Children's Hospital Los Angeles. I'm so glad you could join us today to join this teleconference discussing iron and how during the first two years of life, our patients are not getting enough iron in their diet. Today's teleconference is entitled, Iron for Young Children, Reinforcing the Message. I do need to disclose to you that I am a consultant for Nestle Infant Nutrition. The objectives for this talk are as follows. One, to reinforce the importance of dietary iron for infants and young children. Two, for me to explain to you the low adherence for the recommendations surrounding iron intake during complementary feedings. Three, raise awareness of changing trends that impact iron intake. And four, highlight the importance of including foods rich with iron during complementary feeding. The definitions for iron store depletion and iron deficiency vary. Iron deficiency anemia results from iron deficiency. Here on this slide, you see the stages of iron status and prevalence of iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia in the United States. I'm going to describe to you the differences between depletion, decreased transport, and decreased hemoglobin, which is anemia. With low iron stores, you have depletion. In this case, there are low or no iron stores. However, the tissues that need iron are able to maintain normal function. Here, the ferritin is less than 40 micrograms per liter. While there are no national data, it is estimated that 22 up to 34% of California infants receiving WIC in 2005 have low iron stores. With iron deficiency, there is decreased transport to target organs. So here, there is insufficient iron to maintain normal tissue function, and not enough oxygen gets to the blood, brain, or muscle. Here, transferrin saturation is less than 15%, and ferritin stores are even lower at less than 12 micrograms per liter. It's thought that 8% of the general population of infants and toddlers in 2015 have iron deficiency. Another study showed that 9.2% among one to three year olds were iron deficient. And NHANES data from 2005 to 2008 showed 15.9% of children between the ages of one to two years deficient. In iron deficiency anemia, you see decreased hemoglobin. Therefore, you have compromised tissue function in the organs which have high oxygen requirements, such as in the brain, blood, and muscle. Here you start to see a drop in hemoglobin of less than 11 grams per deciliter, and ferritin is almost absent at less than 10 micrograms per liter. While there are no infant data, it is thought that up to 3% of children aged one to three years have iron deficiency anemia. However, when you look at low-income infants, the number can be as high as 18% in those six to 17 months of age. According to the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, and Haynes, 2005 to 2008 data, 15.9% of children aged one to two years are iron deficient. This is much higher than a previous estimate of 7% in 2000, but the difference may be due to a change in NHANES methodology from using just ferritin to using ferritin and total body iron model, which incorporates both ferritin and serum transferrin to estimate iron status. The goal of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services is to reduce the prevalence of 
not getting enough iron in their diet. Today's teleconference is entitled, Iron for Young Children, Reinforcing the Message. I do need to disclose to you that I am a consultant for your status. The goal of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services is to reduce the prevalence of iron deficiency in this age group to 14.3%, which is a 10% reduction by the year 2020. Iron deficiency anemia remains significant in low-income populations. This graph shows trends in prevalence of anemia among children less than five years by race and ethnicity. Data from the Pediatric Nutrition Surveillance Report in 2010 show 18% iron deficiency anemia in babies 6 to 17 months of age, low income, in all races. The highest rates were seen in black, non-Hispanic infants, followed by multiple race, Hispanic, American Indian, Asian, and white. The Pediatric Nutrition Surveillance Report recommends that we should promote adequate dietary iron intake in infants of all races. Iron deficiency has serious and lasting consequences, which include impaired development that can affect both mental, psychomotor, emotional, and social areas. It can also lead to impaired immunity. Iron deficiency, even without anemia, contributes to developmental delays and impaired cognitive function. Iron deficiency anemia has been referred to as a pediatric failure because it causes irreversible damage and it is preventable. In the social and emotional realm, infants with iron deficiency anemia are more wary, hesitant, fearful, withdrawn, shy, unhappy, or tense. They're also less playful, show less pleasure, and have less reaction to usual stimuli. This influences how the infant reacts to caregivers and environment and subsequent development. In the cognitive and developmental realm, these patients have lower scores on mental tests, six to 15 points lower with iron deficiency anemia. They also have lower scores in gross and the motor coordination, six to 17 points lower with iron deficiency anemia. This is not transient, there is persistent functional impairment at ages 11 to 14 years, despite complete correction of the iron deficiency anemia during infancy. Most importantly, this is preventable. There are several risk factors for developing iron deficiency. These include inadequate oral intake, physiologic states with compromised iron requirements, pathologic factors and diseases, and perhaps socioeconomic factors. Under inadequate oral intake, we have breastfeeding without iron supplementation, failure to ingest iron-rich foods, and early or excessive cow milk intake. Under physiologic states where there's compromised iron requirements, there can be increased iron demands during pregnancy and low iron stores during infancy, especially in preterm infants. Pathologic factors due to disease include blood loss, chronic diseases, malabsorption of iron, and genetic disorders. And we can't neglect the socioeconomic factors, which probably play a role, including low socioeconomic status, low maternal education, and perhaps the number of children that you have. All of these things can lead to iron deficiency. Infant feeding can also influence the risks for iron deficiency. These include breastfeeding without an iron supplement, lack of intake of iron-rich foods, early or excessive cow milk intake. All of these lead to inadequate iron intake in infancy and iron deficiency, which can then lead to anemia. Healthcare providers need to be aware that iron stores from birth may not protect all breastfed infants through six months of age. Iron stores vary widely. Infants born with low iron stores may develop deficiency at four months rather than six months. Infants are born with iron stores that protect them from iron deficiency, usually for the first four to six months of life. The amount of iron storage infants are born with varies widely. The degree of variation is related to several factors, but some remain unknown. For example, boys tend to have lower iron stores than females. 
late preterm infants may be at even greater risk of developing iron deficiency before six months of age. Delayed cord clamping may protect infants from developing iron deficiency. Thus, some infants may need supplemental iron at four months. Infants exclusively breastfed for six months may be at an increased risk for developing iron deficiency compared to those exclusively breastfed for four months. In a randomized controlled trial, introduction of a complementary food at four months of age compared to introduction at six months of age resulted in a small positive effect on iron status at six months of age without affecting growth rate. This graph describes the incidence of iron depletion and deficiency in breastfed infants over a 12-month period of time. On the x-axis is age. On the y-axis is the percent with low ferritin. The dark blue are those with ferritin less than 10, and the light blue are those with ferritin less than 12. In this study, iron deficiency anemia was defined as a plasma ferritin of less than 10 micrograms per liter. Also depicted here are the number of infants with iron deficiency, sometimes defined by a low ferritin level of less than 12 micrograms per liter. The important point is that about 10% of breastfed infants with no additional iron sources developed low ferritin by 7.5 months. This is much higher than many healthcare practitioners would expect. Now, let's talk about the shocking low adherence to iron recommendations by both healthcare providers, parents, and patients. There are expert recommendations for complementary feeding. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that breastfed infants receive about one milligram of iron per kilo per day from complementary foods beginning at six months of age. The AAP also recommends two servings per day of iron-rich foods for infants greater than six months of age. The AAP also recommends iron-fortified cereals and pureed meats as first foods since they contain adequate iron and zinc. Although the heme iron in meat is more bioavailable than the non-heme iron in fortified cereal, infant cereal is more commonly consumed by young infants. According to the Infant Feeding and Practices Study, FPS2, from 2005 to 2007, 40.4% of mothers introduced solid foods before four months of age. In another IFPS2 analysis, 18% of six-month-old breastfed and mixed-fed infants had not received infant cereal or meat in the seven days prior to questioning. Among exclusively breastfed six-month-old infants, 23% had not received infant cereal, meat, or regular iron supplements. Over half of the infants, 58% of those mixed-fed and 70% of those solely breastfed, did not receive the recommended two servings per day of iron-rich food sources, including infant cereal, meat, or iron-fortified infant formula. And they did not receive routine iron supplementation by mouth. Thus, compliance with iron recommendations fall short. 70% of breastfed six-month-olds did not consume iron-rich foods or supplements with adequate frequency. 23% of breastfed six-month-olds had no regular iron supplementation in their diet. Despite the recommendations to include two servings of iron-rich foods per day with complementary feedings, many mothers in the United States do not adhere to these guidelines. It should not surprise you that early introduction of cow's milk is associated with iron deficiency in infants. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends cow's milk only after 12 months of age. However, as shown by this graph, 16% of infants 9 to 11.9 months consumed cow's milk. Excess cow milk consumption of greater than 24 ounces per day is associated with severe iron deficiency anemia in toddlers. On this graph is the percent of infants consuming cow's milk early. On this graph, 5.8% of six to 8.9 month olds consumed cow milk at least once per day. 16.6% .6 of nine to 11.9 month olds consumed cow milk at least once per day. 
Children fed predominantly cow milk at nine months of age were more likely to have iron deficiency at one year than those who fed breast milk or infant formula. Excessive cow milk consumption in toddlers is associated with severe iron deficiency anemia. There are several mechanisms by which we think early or excessive cow milk consumption leads to iron deficiency anemia. First, there is a low concentration of iron in cow's milk. Second, cow milk consumption during infancy is associated with occult intestinal blood loss, which depletes iron. This diminishes by about age one. Third, heme iron concentration is inhibited by the calcium and casein, which are present in high amounts in cow's milk. Now let's talk about changing trends in complementary feeding. This graph shows the inadequate dietary intakes of iron, which increased among infants between the FITS 2002 and FITS 2008 studies. The Feeding Infants and Toddlers Study, FITS, was conducted both in 2002 and 2008 and documented the feeding patterns of children 4 to 24 months of age in the United States. As you can see, the percent of all infants taking less than the recommended intakes of iron increased from 2002 to 2008. WIC participants had better intake because they receive iron-rich foods such as iron-fortified cereal and infant formula. Infant cereal is a top source of iron, along with infant formula. Infant cereal is a key component of overall dietary iron and zinc intake in infants and young children. Analysis of the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey and Haines 2005 to 2012 revealed that among complementary foods, infant cereal is the highest source of iron and zinc among children 6 to 11.9 months old. In contrast, baby food meats and dinners and non-baby food meats and eggs contribute only a small percentage to the total dietary intake of zinc and iron in the same age group. Cereals remain a key source of micronutrients in toddlers, especially for iron. When infants do consume meat, the most common source is chicken, turkey, followed by hot dogs, sausages, and cold cuts. Unfortunately, iron-fortified infant cereal consumption has been declining among older infants. In this graph are the percent of infants and toddlers consuming infant cereal based on the FITS study, with 2002 in dark blue and 2008 in light blue. You can see in this chart that fewer infants aged four to five months and nine to 11 months consumed infant cereal in 2008 compared to 2002. This overall decline in infant cereal consumption is a concern and could easily contribute to inadequate iron intakes if other iron-rich foods are not consumed in the diet. Among children nine to 11.9 months old, the use of infant cereal and baby food meat declined significantly. This was seen as a similar trend for both WIC and non-WIC infants. The percent of infants consuming meats continues to be low, especially with beef. Among six to 8.9 month olds, the percent consuming beef dropped from 2% in 2002 to 0.4% in 2008, while the consumption of poultry remained stable at about 6% and hot dogs also stable at about 1%. Among nine to 11.9 month olds, the consumption of beef also dropped from 6% to 1.7%. Poultry remained stable at about 20% and hot dogs remained stable at about 6%. There are many additional challenges for parents and for healthcare practitioners to ensure that infants receive enough iron in their diet. Parents often look at iron fortified cereal as an interim stage or tummy filler and they do not understand the nutritional value of infant cereals high in iron and zinc. There is also the use of non-infant sugary cereals, which are not equitably fortified with iron. Parents may also have questions about the arsenic in rice cereal for infants. Because of this, the FDA has put in place a guidance level for arsenic in infant rice cereal, which manufacturers may already meet. 
the AAP recommendation is to offer infants a variety of grains. At around six months, infant cereals can be introduced. Rice cereal fortified with iron is a good source of nutrients, but it shouldn't be the only source and doesn't have to be necessarily the first source. There are several conclusions we can draw from these studies. First, iron deficiency remains a problem among infants and toddlers in the United States. Risk factors for low iron intake include breastfeeding without adequate iron supplementation, early or excessive cow milk consumption before one year of age, and inadequate iron intake from complementary foods such as fortified iron cereal. Iron fortified infant cereal is the top food source of iron and unfortunately its use is declining. Other good sources of iron include red meat, but there is very low consumption of red meat among infants in the United States, especially beef. When infants consume meat, they are typically not iron-rich sources. Therefore, healthcare providers should emphasize adequate iron intake during the first years of life to prevent deficiency and iron deficiency anemia. So here are some key messages regarding iron for parents that you as a healthcare practitioner can impart. The following three things are all risk factors for inadequate iron intake. Number one, breastfeeding without an iron supplement. It's recommended that one milligram per kilogram per day of liquid iron for exclusively or partially breastfed infants should occur until iron-rich foods are introduced into the diet. Two, discuss the lack of iron-rich foods in the diet. It is recommended that iron-rich foods should start at four to six months of life when the patient is developmentally ready. There should be at least two servings of iron-rich foods per day, and this can include pureed red meats and a variety of iron-fortified cereals. This message should be reinforced during follow-up visits until two years of age. Third, Early or excessive cow milk intake is associated with iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia. Therefore, the patient should not be ingesting cow milk before one year of life. They should have breast milk or iron fortified formula until 12 months of age and avoid excessive cow milk during the toddler years. So thank you for joining me today on today's teleconference discussing the iron requirements and needs of infants and toddlers in the United States. It's actually pretty shocking the number of children that have iron deficiency and iron deficiency anemia. The good news is this is preventable. So be sure to discuss with your parents and the patients their preferences for eating foods that are rich in iron. Thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Pisak, for such extraordinary conference. Now we're open to questions. The first questions that I have is, what is the difference between the different iron compounds found in food? So this is a really good question. And we have to remember that not all iron is the same. Uh, there are basically two kinds of iron. So there's the heme iron and non-heme iron. And heme iron uh, obviously means iron that's in hemoglobin. Um, so that's in red meat and then organ meats like liver. Um, and then non-heme iron is found in things like beans, lentils, spinach, kale, apricots, uh, things like that. Um, so the heme iron is more bioavailable, meaning it's easier to digest and absorb. So even if the children are eating a lot of things like you know spinach and beans, uh, it's more difficult to digest these and the iron is not as bioavailable. Okay. The other question is how can adequate iron absorption be guaranteed from family food and supplements if iron status and markers are not routinely assessed? Yeah, this is a tough one. I think, I hope after listening to this seminar that practitioners will be aware that iron deficiency is very common, but uh, low iron stores is actually more common. And unless you're measuring things like ferritin, uh, you may not 
be aware that the stores are low. Um, so some things that you can look for in physical exam, um, the child could be pale, they may have clubbing of the fingernails, dry hair, dry skin, apathy. Um, sometimes these symptoms don't occur until the children are profoundly anemic. Maybe one of the easiest ways is for the practitioner just to take a, a general history. Uh, say the child is 10 months old. You wanna know, is that child ingesting cow milk? Is that child breastfed? Did that child get uh, iron during breastfeeding? And are they getting the recommended AAP uh, two servings of iron rich foods per day? And that can include iron rich cereals and, and iron rich uh, fruits and vegetables like we talked about. Um, and, and it's important for the practitioner to identify this. As we said earlier, um, it's not as simple as saying, oh, this patient's iron deficient here. I can give you some iron. Oh, the number's good, you're good. If they have low iron stores or iron deficiency or, or anemia for a prolonged period of time, uh, these patients have cognitive deficits and motor deficits that can be permanent. And when they're tested later in life, these deficits remain. So it's, it's important to ask a thorough dietary history and, and make sure the kids aren't getting enough iron. And if they're not, then you may wanna do something like a CBC and, and ferritin and, and iron levels. Okay. It is necessary to start infant cereals? So there's lots of different sources of iron. Um, and again, the, the supplement we're recommending for patients who are breastfeeding because there's really not enough iron in, in breast milk. Um, and for the babies who are getting uh, infant formula, that is fortified uh, with iron. Uh, so they don't need a supplement as far as like a liquid supplement. Uh, once the baby is, is four to six months of age and, and they're getting complementary foods, the recommendation does become that they should have two sources of iron fortified foods. And that can include iron fortified cereal, uh, meats, and again, the heme iron, uh, which is in meats is more bioavailable. And then other things like green leafy vegetables and, and beans. Okay, the wheat that we can find in infant cereals have some interaction with the iron absorption? Yeah, there was some question that I think it's the phytates in, in wheat um, that may hinder iron absorption. However, when the cereal is processed and the meat is, the wheat is milled, uh, those phytates decrease. So there are no data that state that putting iron in a wheat-based cereal decreases the iron absorption. That, that does not happen. I have, um, what is the recommendation for fortified cereal since milk can help to block the iron absorption? So as we talked about, milk can uh, do several things to the baby uh, to inhibit uh, their iron stores. So number one, when the baby fills up on milk, they really don't wanna eat solid foods. So it's, it's less intake. Uh, also, a baby's under 12 months of age, the milk causes some microscopic blood loss in the stool. So you may not see it, but it's happening. And you lose iron that way when you lose the, the heme in the stool. And then also, as talked about in the video, um, the casein and, and calcium in uh, cow milk can actually interfere with iron absorption. So we recommend against those things uh, like cow milk consumption to improve iron absorption. Okay. Uh, it is recommended to use iron supplements routinely by four months in breastfed babies? Yeah. So if the baby was born at term and is healthy, then that is the recommendation. Um, however, as I stated in the video, um, some babies may be at increased risk for lower iron stores. So male infants, late preterm infants, infants where the cord is clamped early. Um, so these babies may not have the full iron stores because they're, they're born early or, or some of these other conditions. Um, so those babies may not make it out to six months. You know, they may need to be supplemented earlier. Says so some cultures do not introduce meat until two years of age. Yeah, so in those circumstances, it's very important that those children get iron from other sources. So green leafy vegetables, iron fortified cereals, um, things like that. 
I, I mean, there are lots of cultures where they don't eat meat at all. So in that case, they need to get non-heme sources of iron. And especially for the babies, because it's really critical that they build up these iron stores during the first two years for normal neurologic development. Um, having iron rich cereals uh, is a really good way to achieve that because the texture is, is easy for the babies to eat. Uh, there are several questions related to the concern of constipation and iron. Yeah, so, so people get concerned about iron supplements and constipation, but um, the amount of iron that's in uh, the recommended AAP dose, which is one milligram per kilogram per day for breastfed infants, and the amount of iron that is in infant formula and cereals is a physiologic amount, um, and it's not associated with constipation. Uh, rice can be used to treat diarrhea and can cause constipation, so a lot of rice may contribute to firmer stools. Um, but every baby's poop is different. You know, some babies have looser poop, some babies have more watery poops. Um, but the, the iron that is in cereals that are meant for babies and formula um, does not cause constipation. Uh, although iron should be given daily, would the in uptake of supplemental be more efficient if given on alternative dates? days? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, you don't want to give too much iron at one time, not because of constipation, but because it gets taken up in the liver and you mm -hmm. can have iron overload. Uh, one of the ways that you can increase iron absorption is making sure that the baby also gets vitamin C. Um, so they should have vitamin C rich foods, you know, like citrus foods, um, and that will promote the absorption of, of iron. I think, you know, if you do every other day dosing and it's a physiologic dose, that's, that's fine too. But um, the recommendations is one per kilo per day by the AAP. So then you would be doing, doing two per kilo every other day. And that's, that's a little bit on the higher side. Okay. What if a family has not alternative to cow's milk and other sources of natural iron is not readily available? Would a dose of eight milligrams per kilogram of iron be reasonable to use, or this dose can be increased? That is a really large dose of iron. So even for really severe iron deficiency anemia, we usually don't go above three to, to four milligrams per kilogram per dose. I personally rarely go above three milligrams per kilogram per dose. Now, if the baby has to drink cow milk, Um, I think that cow milk is, you know, ingested a, a little bit as a replacement for formula. So say the baby's drinking 24 ounces of formula and they turn one, then automatically sometimes the parents will say, well, I just put in the bottle the same amount of cow's milk as the formula we're drinking. But there's a huge difference, right? So as we talked about, the cow milk for many reasons is going to inhibit iron absorption, cause iron loss, and also fill up their tummies so they don't want foods. Um, so it's not a great substitute. And if the patients are nutritionally adequate, you know, they should be getting other things like, like water and not cow milk. And there are many things in the diet that aren't super expensive, like say beans um, and green leafy vegetables, if you can get them. Uh, to try and increase the iron stores. I definitely would not be giving eight per kilo as a one-time dose. If you have really severe iron deficiency or you've got some sort of disease, say celiac disease or Crohn's disease or another disease where you cannot absorb the iron, um, some not, sometimes those patients will get IV iron at, at doses that high. Um, but I've never given oral doses that high. That sounds uh, excessively high to me. Okay. Is iron requirement for boys different from girls uh, between six to 24 months of age? That's a great question. Um, you would think so because male babies on average have less iron stores than female babies. Uh, but again, if they are fed formula, which has adequate iron and they start taking complementary foods as recommended by the AAP of, of two doses per day, or two servings per day, um, they catch up to the girls. Uh, so we normally don't recommend higher doses for the boys. Are cereals necessary after 12 months in terms of an iron, so as an iron source? 
So it depends on the child's diet. You know, if they're getting heme iron, like, you know, we talked about in meats and good sources of non-heme iron, then they probably don't need it. Um, but what's nice about the infant cereal is you can add, you know, water or milk, small amounts of milk, um, and make it to the consistency that the baby likes. You know, some babies like runny, some babies like very thick, and there's a lot of iron in there. And what we're afraid of is that many families are, are giving cereals that are these sugary and sweet cereals. I don't know which are the ones that are you know, popular where you guys live, but I'm sure you can think of all sorts of cereals that have, you know, animals and birds and, you know, little munchkins and things on them that is really just sugar in a bowl, right? There's no yeah. good protein, there's no iron. So we wanna be careful that if you are giving cereal, you're giving the appropriate cereal. Um, but if the baby has advanced to eating other forms of heme and non-heme iron, we should be okay that they can wean off the cereals. Okay, and the last question that I have is related to the arsenic. Can you explain a little bit more about this? Yeah, so um, back in 2016, uh, the Food and Drug Administration and the AAP made some recommendations and they put a limit of 100 parts per billion for inorganic arsenic in infant rice cereal. So 100 parts per billion is a really low amount. And people say, well, why can't you just make it zero? Um, but you can't measure zero, so you have to put a cutoff. Um, so that level of 100 parts per billion um, is based on uh, evidence that the FDA reviewed. And um, the guidance that the FDA at that point, which was in 2016, gave to parents and caregivers is that Again, you need to make sure the baby gets iron fortified cereals, um, but you can consider other fortified cereals in addition to rice if you're worried. So they can include oat cereal, barley cereal, multigrain cereal, um, and the AAP also agrees with that statement. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Piesak, for being with us today. Really interesting uh, presentation, and thank you for all the responses for our questions. And I really want to thank you all for being and sharing this time uh, with us. I wish you all have a good night. Thank you. Good night, everybody.